ready to go. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Nick Perry. I am the current president of the Mountain View Historical Association. Um, the Mountain View Historical Association is a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to preserving Mountain View's history and sharing it with the public. This is our second webinar, our second Zoom webinar, our second virtual event. And we're so pleased you all could join us here today for a talk focusing on the history of women's suffrage in the Mountain View area. Um, we got a few people here today I wanted to introduce you to who you may or may not know. First, we have Emily Ramos, our treasurer. She is also kind of helping us. If you have any technical difficulties with the uh, webinar today, please just chat her in the chat or email her at, um, Emily, what's your email? Emily00 at gmail. All right, so hopefully you don't have any issues, but if you do, contact Emily. And then we also have joining us here today, Pamela Baird and Dr. Amy Ellison, and I will be introducing them shortly. But before we get there, just a little bit of a rundown on how our session today is going to go. Um, one second while I pull up my notes. So uh, we are going to have a fantastic video uh, that was created by Pamela that shows a perspective of a women's suffragist in the Mountain View area uh, done in the first person. We're gonna have a slideshow about places in Mountain View associated with the suffragist mov movement. And we're gonna have a talk from Dr. Amy Ellison about the Rise Up exhibit at the Los Altos History Museum, which is chronicling uh, the suffragist movement and putting in the larger context of history that she's gonna walk us through. Uh, but before we start all of that, we actually have an election of our own to deal with. Um, we are at the end of our two year period for our board of directors. So that means we will be electing a new president, vice president, treasurer and secretary for our organization. And we're going to attempt to do that virtually. And to describe that, I'm gonna turn it over to Emily who so graciously agreed to host again as the chair of our nomination committee this past uh, year. So Emily, let's turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Nick. All right, so uh, every two years, according to our bylaws, the Mountain View Historical Association, um, the Mountain View Historical Association, uh, we vote in a new slate for our executive board. Um, and this would be the president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer. We form a nomination committee uh, to find people to fill those spots and for the rest of our board. Uh, but what we are only asking people here, members here to do is to vote for the executive board spots, but we can fill in and let you know who the others are because we have those finalized too as well. So the nomination committee was myself, Mar Marina Marnovich and uh, Candace Bowers, um, who served as the nominations committee where we tried to find people and confirm uh, former board members to continue on or if they wanna hop off to find their replacements. So that being said, we now have a new uh, executive board for our board of directors, which we now have uh, for president, we have Pamela Baird, who's also our panelist today. So yay. Um, next we have vice president, Robert Cox is uh, staying on as our vice president. Um, so that's fun. Next, we have Jamil Sheikh, who is also staying on as secretary, and I will also be staying on as treasurer. So that will be fun. Now, this means that we have uh, Nick, who is now moving from president to immediate past president, which is what we have in our bylaws. So he will still be on our board. There's no way we're really letting him go. He's kind of with us for life. Um, so, uh, so Nick is now moved to the immediate past president position on our board of directors and, uh, our current immediate past president, Candace Bowers will now be moved to our historical data committee chair. Um, and to continue on with the rest of us, we will ha also have a new membership committee chair, Ida Rose Sylvester, congratulations. Um, Membership co uh, Newsletter Committee Chair, uh, John Cortez is staying on. Ways and Means Committee Chair, Mark Perry, staying on. Director at Large, Gil Lane, staying on. Publicity Chair, Marina Marnovich um, is also staying on. And Director at Large, uh, Lisa Garcia. Um, so we need to do a formal vote to confirm the slate 
and then we can move forward with the rest of the program. So before we vote on our slate, I still we still can accept more nominations. If anyone so chooses, please feel free to type into the chat or um, yeah, the chat is probably the best way to do this. So I am going to give us exactly one minute for people to type in the chat if they have any other nominations. And to clarify, this is solely right now, we're voting on just the president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer. All the other positions that Emily mentioned, they will be voted on at our next board meeting. So right now, it's just those four positions we're voting on. And the floor is open for another 30 seconds for additional nominations for those four positions. And once again, special thanks to the uh, the rest of the nominations committee, Candace and, and Marina, to, who helped track down everyone and then remind them, hey, we sent you this email. Please get back to us. <laughs> and with that, oh, we have a Q&A. Uh, yes, and the question is, sorry to ask this question, but this panel is going to discuss the history of the women's suffrage movement. What time will it start? It will start as soon as we are done voting. <laughs> so I'm going to say that we're answering live. All right, so I, I'll turn on the poll right now then. Okay. So if you are a member, please uh, vote if you approve on the slate as it's listed in the question. We'll keep it open for about a minute. And then we will move on to our, our program on women's suffrage. Thank you all for bearing with us while we do this official business at our uh, biannual um, members meeting. And if you're not a member, we encourage you to join us. Uh, membership dues are only, I believe, $10 a year right now. I, I think, I think that's 15. right. 15. Oh, sorry. I should know that. Um, but your membership dues, if you do join us, the Historical Association, help us continue to have these free events. Um, you know, things cost money these days, especially Zoom accounts and whatnot. So if uh, your membership basically helps us continue to offer these free programs. So um, we welcome folks, whether or not they're members, to join our events, to come and uh, experience Mountain View history. Um, but we do really appreciate our members and those who uh, help us financially uh, keep running as a small volunteer run nonprofit. Okay, well, I think we kept it open for a minute. We have unanimous approval of the board. Um, and I think we uh, will move on from there. So I'll just close by saying it's been an absolute honor to serve as your president for the past two years. Um, as Emily mentioned, um, I'm not going anywhere. Past president is an official member of the executive board of directors, but I am so excited to welcome Pamela Bear to our board as our new president of the Mountain View Historical Association officially as of now, and also as our guest speaker today. So congratulations, Pamela. Welcome to the board. Um, let me just read your bio since we just elected you. <laughs> um, so Pamela Barrett has been a resident of Mountain View since 1998. She has enjoyed the challenges and rewards of being a business owner for over 35 years. Six years ago, she reduced the scope of her business, which has allowed her more time to do other things like becoming president of the Mountain View Historical Association. Pamela has served on the Human Relations Commission and the Environmental Planning Commission of the City of Mountain View travel, the arts of all kinds, exercise and volunteering are important segments of her daily life. Researching women's suffrage efforts in Mountain View has been a full diversion during the current COVID-19 times. So uh, that is Pamela and uh, Pamela, I'm gonna turn it over to you to say a few words and to introduce us to the first part of our program, which is our video. Well, thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate your confidence in me. I look forward to doing some fun things with the Historical Association. We really won't get into some of the goals right now, but uh, we did have a, an imagining meeting earlier in the year. I think it was right before COVID. So we have some firm ideas about what we want to do and, and kind of where we want to go. So the reason I am presenting today is um, I was asked last year, along with some other women from uh, other people from the League of Women Voters and from AAUW, to help provide research for the exhibit that is over at the Los Altos History Museum. And I found lots of information um, at the Mountain View Library, which has a database which can only be accessed at the library. So I would spend Thursday afternoons over at the library. 
And um, also, if you go to the historical room, um, you can page through the folios of the old newspapers. And I just found it so fascinating after I got into it and found out how much work the local women did that I thought there's a story here that we need to tell um, about how engaged the local women were. In this very small community, they did a lot of work in, in terms of trying to get men to get behind the idea of women's suffrage. And so that's the genesis of my crazy um, little uh, endeavor here. So what I thought I would do, rather than having it be something that um, I would read and have sort of a dry presentation about, and then on such and such a date, we did this. So rather, I took an imaginary, um, created an imaginary alter ego um, of a woman in 1922 living here in Mountain View and what her experiences would have been over the last decade as far as what was done uh, by the local women, um, and then also dovetailing that into the general um, women's suffrage um, effort um, uh, nationwide. So um, I am no actress, <laughs> I'm not a thespian, but um, anyway, I hope you'll find this interesting. And Nick has got the uh, driver's, uh, is in a driver's seat with this, so let's hope we can get this thing to go. Thanks, Pamela. And I just realized that I forgot to introduce our other panelist and read her bio. I'm just going to do that right now before I turn on my share screen to share your video. But we're also joined and very excited to be joined by Dr. Amy Noel Ellison, who is the exhibit curator at the Los Altos History Museum, where she recently curated Rise Up, the Fight for Women's Suffrage, an exhibit celebrating the 100th anniversary of women's right to vote. Um, Dr. Ellison received her BA in history from Fresno State and her PhD in history from Boston University where she wrote her dissertation on the 1775-76 American invasion of Canada. From 2016 to 2018, Ellison was an Andrew W. Mellon postdoctoral curatorial fellow at the American Philosophical Society Museum in Philadelphia, has also worked as a researcher at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. So she will be speaking uh, shortly after we share this video. So thank you so much, Dr. Ellison. Thank you for joining us. And I am going to attempt to share my screen. So let's get that queued up and going. All right, can we see that, Pamela and I, Amy? Good. All right. Uh, I have to mute myself. <laughs> Was the sound working when I pressed play? I uh, couldn't tell. It was very low. Sorry, technical difficulties, folks. I'm going to press play. Um, let me know if you can see it in the chat. Or actually, Pamela, let me know if you can hear it. You should be able to hear some music right now. Remember the ladies Abigail Adams implored her husband John Adams in 1776 when he was participating in the Continental Congress. In a letter to him, she urged him and other members to quote, be more favorable and generous to them than your ancestors, end quote. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Erna Klopping. My husband and I moved to Mountain View about 20 years ago. It's now just a few days before the 1922 election. 10 years after women first voted in Mountain View and only two years after the 19th Amendment was enacted and women had the chance to vote nationally. I've been asked to give a review of those events. 
The gathering of women in Seneca Falls in 1848 is considered to be the beginning of the suffrage movement in the United States. 300 women gathered there to discuss the role of women in society and how it could be improved. They wrote and adopted a Declaration of Rights and Sentiments, which included the right to vote. This brings us to the heart of the matter. How do you persuade someone, in this case men, to grant rights to others, women, that don't enjoy those same rights? How do you ask men to share power with women? And how do you convince men that women's suffrage is a right and a necessary part of our democracy? Not much advancement was made in the next 20 years following Seneca Falls. After the Civil War, there were two major suffrage organizations that pursued different strategies. Some women felt that suffrage should be pursued as a national effort with an amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Other women felt that a state-by-state -state strategy would yield better results. The first state, actually a territory at the time, to grant suffrage to women was Wyoming in 1869. But it was another 24 years until the next state, Colorado, grant suffrage to women in 1893. This was followed by the states of Utah and Idaho in 1896. This map shows the dates in which states passed suffrage laws. In 1896, an attempt at passing women's suffrage in California suffered a resounding defeat by male voters. There were several reasons the referendum failed. Women's efforts were underfunded and not focused. But most notable was the opposition from the saloon and alcohol industries, which feared that if women got the vote, alcohol would be banned. The temperance movement, which sought to ban alcohol, was a well-established movement across the country. The biggest organization was the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which was founded in 1874. It's also known by the words WCTU. In addition to abolishing alcohol, the group sought to reform labor laws, child welfare laws, and raise the age of consent. There is an active chapter here in Mountain View. After the 1896 defeat, a number of the women's suffrage groups disbanded. But some of this effort was taken up by women's clubs, which had formed in many cities across the country and here in California as well. There were clubs in Palo Alto, Mountain View, Cupertino, and Sunnyvale, and many other cities and towns across the state. The topics of political corruption, concern for public welfare, the treatment of women workers were also raised within these clubs. These clubs watched for changing social and political conditions that might signal chances for the advancements of these concerns and especially that of suffrage. In 1907, another suffrage amendment was passed by the state assembly, but it failed to get out of the state senate. The governor threatened to veto the bill even if it did pass. Women marched in 1908 to urge the legislature to try again. This photo is from a march in Oakland. For many decades, the California State House was heavily influenced by the interests of the railroads, which blocked any efforts at regulation or regulating shipping rates. The high shipping rates affected us here in Mountain View because the fruit growers had to pay exceedingly high rates to ship their products back east to the big markets. Several prominent newspapers exposed this corruption. A reform-focused branch of the Republican Party pledged to radically change the legislature by running reform-minded candidates. In 1910, Hiram Johnson was elected as the governor, and he pledged to support women's suffrage. In March of 1911, the state legislature voted to have a suffrage amendment put on the ballot for a special election on October 10, 1911. At last, we had another chance to win the vote. The amendment would be called number eight. Here is an image of a poster urging its passage. The theme of justice was commonly used in 
the argument for suffrage. Women supporters had just eight months to get organized, get funded, and figure out a strategy for success. Many different groups were organized, each addressing a different group of women, like working class women in San Francisco and women living in rural areas. A contest was held to design a poster. The winner was a beautiful image of a woman standing in front of the Golden Gate. The setting sun forms a halo around the woman's head, which we felt indicated that our struggle was a just one. Two organizations, the California Equal Suffrage Association and the Women's Suffrage League became the lead groups in Northern California. I joined the group in the spring of 1911 when we started the effort to convince local men to vote for the amendment. I'm wearing white, the color of the suffrage movement. The color was selected for several reasons. One, most women owned a white blouse which they could wear to show solidarity with the movement. Another reason was that women would stand out when marching in large parades in the big cities back east. You also see me wearing the Votes for Women sash. The color selected had a purpose, purple for loyalty, white for purity, and yellow for hope and success. In our first meetings, we learned how to talk about the amendment to all types of men, farm laborers, businessmen, and even that grumpy old uncle who didn't want to see change. We also learned how to speak to women who were not in favor of the amendment. A group of us wrote many postcards to our friends, family, and businesses to encourage men to vote for Amendment 8. Tens of thousands of postcards were mailed by women across the state. Over 70,000 postcards were mailed in Los Angeles County alone. This postcard was one of the most popular cards sent. I heard that the Mountain View Postmaster said that he could always tell when we had held a meeting because two or three days later, there would be a pile of postcards in the outgoing box. In September and the first week of October, our efforts were really intensified. Meetings were held almost daily, many of which lasted several hours. Our meetings were held in the Masonic Hall, the community room above Swallows Market, the Glen Theater, and the homes of many women. A full day meeting, including lunch, was held the Friday before the election. The local newspaper, the Register Leader, announced and covered most of our meetings. The editor, Mr. Smith, was in favor of women's suffrage, so he wrote long articles about our activities. In fact, he wrote in 1910, quote, we will here give warning that this editor will write of women's suffrage in the next issue of this paper. So all who can't stand it may have a chance to skip this issue or leave town. Several local women were the primary speakers at our meetings. Mrs. Gates of Mountain View, Mrs. Alice Park, and Mrs. Arnaud of Palo Alto appeared a number of times. A frequent speaker was Miss Ethel Durst, who was a student at Stanford and active in the College Equal Suffrage League. The week before the election, she gave an impassioned speech in which she said, quote, man asks why we want the ballot? We point to the social conscious that needs awakening and to the great social evils that exist today, end quote. Her mother, Miss Sophie Durst of Sunnyvale also spoke several times about women's desire to make the world better. But our meetings weren't just full of speeches. We also had entertainment. Mrs. Lida Talbot of Los Altos, who was an accomplished thespian, gave renditions from the book Witter Doodles, a funny satire about life. Although the book was written more than a decade earlier, it was still timely and entertaining. We also sang suffrage songs with accompaniment by Mrs. Gates on the piano. A fun meeting was held at the Glen Theater. Here is the advertisement from that newspaper. Mr. Campen, the owner, decorated the walls with suffrage posters. We watched film reels of suffrage efforts from around the state. Many local men were supportive and helpful in our efforts. Mr. Durst of Sunnyvale, the husband of the same Mrs. Durst I mentioned earlier, spoke several times about the 
need for women to enjoy full citizenship. Several others paid the rental fees for the local halls for our meetings. Even prominent speakers came to visit us. At one meeting, Judge Hayden of San Francisco gave a very effective and satisfying argument in favor of women's suffrage. Was there opposition to the suffrage movement? Oh, you bet there was. It was conservative newspapers and politicians who had the means to speak against the measure. Some business and civic leaders were quite vocal in their opposition, even setting up organizations to counter our efforts. Here is a poster produced by one of the No groups. Mr. Smith, the editor of the Register Leader, occasionally printed opinion pieces from local men who were opposed to women's suffrage. Those opposed had many reasons. Women would be sullied by the rough and tumble politics. Women didn't have the capacity to understand complex problems and that women should be at home with their families. This cartoon shows the topics only women were capable of finding important, like fashion, romance, and puppies. It was not just men that felt this way, for many women also argued against suffrage. October 10, 1911, Election Day came. It was a sunny day, and we hoped that that meant it was a good omen. We had women sit outside the polling places to ensure that no men were intimidated and to act as a silent reminder that we wanted that vote. Several women brought sandwiches and lemonade to the poll workers, which was most appreciated. Because the polls closed at 8 p.m., we knew that there would be no results that evening. Nonetheless, we were very nervous about the outcome. The next afternoon, Mr. Smith from the newspaper called Mrs. Gates to tell her that the measure was losing, primarily because of the large number of no votes from San Francisco. She called a meeting for us at her house. I admit, I cried a few bitter tears of disappointment, as did the others. Women across the state had worked so hard to get the amendment passed. We wondered, could we have done more locally to convince men to vote for the amendment? Are there other parts of the state that are just too entrenched in old ways? Would opposing powerful groups continue to thwart our efforts? We went to bed Wednesday night thinking that our cause was lost yet again. I tossed and turned most of the night or so it seemed. But by Thursday afternoon, we heard that the results had changed. The vote tallies from many rural areas and from Southern California had safely put the measure over the top by the slimmest of margins. After the final vote count, the measure passed by about 3,500 votes the equivalent of one vote per precinct statewide. This meant that only 50.7% of the men voters supported the measure. But it didn't matter, we prevailed. Santa Clara County did pass the measure. However, it was soundly defeated in San Francisco. The counties of Marin, Alameda, and San Mateo County also defeated the measure. Thursday afternoon, we held a celebration at Mrs. Gates' house. We hugged each other, and this time it was tears of joy. We sang those suffrage songs for one last time. Here are the front pages from the Mountain View Register Leader and the Los Angeles Herald showing the wonderful headlines. These pages, however, don't reflect the final tallies. With the passage of Amendment 8, San Francisco became the largest city in the world in which women were allowed to vote. Passage also increased the number of women allowed to vote in the United States by 50%. California was considered the major tipping point in the struggle for women's suffrage. Here is a popular image showing Lady Liberty marching eastwards to the states in which the battles would next be fought. Women across the state then organized to learn about the process of voting and preparing for our first trip to the polls. Ms. Durst conducted a meeting in the town hall on November 25th entitled Problems Confronting the New Voter. Other meetings were held in the months leading to the first election in which women could vote in Mountain View. This was in April of 1912. 
And oh, what an election it was. For on the ballot was a proposal to close all saloons in Mountain View. As I said earlier, the temperance movement was well established all across the country and in California. Here is a popular image which shows a greedy alcohol producer pitted against a struggling mother and children. A full page double-sided insert was placed in the Mountain View Register leader the Friday before the election. It detailed all the evils of alcohol and the profits made by greedy alcohol producers and sellers. It was not surprising that the measure passed as Mountain View had seven saloons. The nearby towns of Mayfield, Palo Alto, and Sunnyvale were all dry. So if a man wanted a drink, he had to come to Mountain View. Evidently, there were fights in the saloons and road accidents, which of course people didn't like. The change did present an immediate challenge in that the saloon licenses provided revenue to the city. But the city trustees were able to work through the budget crisis. Although I don't know how many women in Mountain View voted in that first election, there is one memorable first-time voter. The polls opened at 6 a.m., and the first person in line at the precinct at City Hall was 80-year-old Mrs. Johnson, 80 years old. When asked why she got there so early, she supposedly said that she was afraid that the good Lord might take her before she had a chance to vote. I also heard that she said that she didn't want the last mention of her in the newspaper to be her obituary, but rather that she was the first one in line to vote when she finally had the chance. And so the suffrage fight continued across the United States. In 1917, the state of New York allowed women the suffrage rights. Other states passed partial suffrage laws. An ongoing effort was also waged to get an amendment to the U.S. Constitution passed by Congress, which finally happened in 1919 as the 19th Amendment. Then it was sent to the states for ratification. The amendment took effect August of 1920 when the state of Tennessee became the 36th and final necessary state to ratify the amendment. Locally, the ratification made little difference to the women in Mountain View, as we already enjoyed the full rights as citizens to vote. An article announcing its passage was relegated to page four of the Mountain View Register Leader. And so, with the upcoming 1922 election, I urge you to vote. Remember the 72-year-long battle that it took to allow women to have the right to vote in the United States. Thank you, remember to vote. Bravo, Pamela. I'm sure if we were in the Adobe building right now, there'd be a large round of applause for you and that fantastic video. Thank you so much for putting that together and uh, bringing uh, this, you know, historical moment and movement down to the local level from the perspective of someone living in Mountain View at the time. Really appreciate it. I think that was great. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Um, so I want to apologize. I don't know what happened on that sound video. Oh, that was my fault. Okay. That was completely my fault. I forgot to share my sound as, as well as my screen. So nothing on your end. But I, so it actually flows very smoothly and the words come out of my mouth at the proper time. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we will uh, work on that. We will be um, posting this eventually to the website, uh, Mountain View Historical Association website, and you will not have to endure this choppy mess up. <laughs> Well, I think it's going to depend on the quality of your own internet connection. But yes, we will put it on YouTube, onto our Facebook page, and we hope everyone will be able to enjoy it and share it widely with their friends and family.
Um, so the next thing we're going to do is kind of do a little bit of a slideshow talk about some of the places that were mentioned in the video. And, and Pam, do you want to queue up your shared screen? And uh, while um, she's queuing that up, oh, it's already up. Great. If you have questions, as some already do, please feel free to put them in the question and answer. We hope to have some time reserved at the end to get into the questions in depth. But go ahead and insert them into there. Um, and if we haven't answered them over the course of uh, Dr. Ellison's presentation or the talk we're about to give right now, we'll get to them at the end of the meeting. So with, uh, with that, uh, let us move on to the slideshow. So uh, places in the Mountain View area that relate to the suffrage effort, some are gone or their locations aren't exactly known, but a few are shown that still exist. And so this is a joint presentation by myself and, and Pamela. So go ahead and get us to the next slide, Pamela. So just to set the scene, Mountain View in 1910, uh, we had a population of 1,161 residents. We were one square mile. Um, these photos show both an aerial view of Mountain View from a water tower, I think in the waterworks, looking towards downtown. Um, and then also here's the intersection of Castro and Villa Street looking south towards El Camino Real in 1910. So a small city, basically the neighborhood that is currently Old Mountain View, um, and Shoreline West and Jackson Park, that was all there was to Mountain View at the time. Everything else was agriculture. Next slide. So as I said in the presentation, Swalls Market um, held a number of meetings. Um, the Swalls uh, had a meat market and actually did quite well. And when they rebuilt their building, um, they added or uh, had a, um, building that had a large second floor. Um, they was sometimes called community room, but sometimes called an opera house. Um, but there was a number of community events of all sorts that were held upstairs. And in terms of where that is today, you can actually see on the left hand side of both photos, the corner of the bank building, which is now home to Red Rock Coffee House. Um, so just to put that on context for those of you who are trying to figure out where this was exactly, and fun trivia fact, the ground floor of the Swall building actually still exists as a part of the larger three-story building that's there today. At some point in the middle of the 20th century, the second floor, the social hall was removed. Probably it was an earthquake safe, as I, but I'm speculating. But then back in the, I think, early 90s, they, they remodeled the building and added uh, two floors above the first floor to create the building that's there today where Alexander's Patisserie is located. And a number of meetings were also held of all types at the Masonic Hall. Um, Nick and I really scrounged around trying to figure out and find photos. Um, it's sort of surprising that there isn't more of a documentation of that. Um, but this is the photo that uh, Nick was able to um, dig up somewhere and I'll let you talk about it. Yeah, so the Masonic, the Masons moved around quite a bit until they moved into their the building they use today on Church Street. Um, that building was originally built as an American Legion Hall in the 1930s, but prior to that, they had a variety of locations. And we believe that the picture on the left here, the hay, grain, and feed uh, lumber company building, they met on the second floor of that building on the 300 block of Castro Street. And as Pamela said, there was also meetings held there for the suffragist movement. The Glen Theater um, brought the latest technologies to Mountain View in 1910. And we referenced that uh, there was a newspaper of account, and we saw the little uh, advertisement um, for a separate meeting at the uh, theater. Yeah, so the Glen Theater was on Castro yeah. Street on the 100 block where Ameren Thai cuisine is now today. Um, they aren't the same building. The Glen Theater was the first building custom built for a movie theater in Mountain View. Um, prior to that, there was actually a small movie theater in the ground floor of the Swall building, which we just pictured a, a few slides ago. Um, but the Glen was the first uh, custom built movie theater in town. So imagine, you know, the suffragists were having their meetings here a, a year after the theater was built. Mount movies were brand new at the time. So it was probably a big deal for a town like Mount View to have its own theater. 
And then the, uh, the Camping family who, who built the Glen Theater, they went ahead and, and they built the Mountain View Theater on Castro Street as well um, in the 1920s, so a few years later. And that building still stands. It is currently the home of the Monte Carlo Nightclub. And then Mrs. Gates was quite an active um, um, personage here in uh, Mountain View. She spoke frequently at the uh, suffrage events and she was a very active member of the WCTU. Um, and she's the one that I referenced who uh, played the piano for the uh, singing of songs. We posted Mrs. Gates' photo onto our Facebook account earlier this week and there was a funny exchange. Someone wrote like, she doesn't look very happy. And just a, a note on that, if you didn't know, it wasn't common to smile in photographs until the 1920s. So you see her here in 1919 before that was prevalent. Uh, her home was located on Calderon Avenue on the outskirts of Old Mountain View at the time. Um, we don't know the precise location of the home. I would take research at the History Center, which is still closed because of the pandemic, but it was on Calderon. It was a part of a small orchard plot. Um, which was, you know, very typical of Calderon Avenue. There was farmhouses with about 10 acre orchards surrounding them. And then um, I did see references in newspaper articles about all the different homes of women um, that uh, hosted meetings. And again, that's really hard to find uh, where these people lived. Um, I did try to go to the census rolls and it's, really cumbersome. Maybe Nick knows a better way to do that, but it's very cumbersome. So um, one reference I did find was um, the Ames building downtown, and there was a reference that um, they lived on Castro Street. So here is the Ames house and or Ames building, and they lived upstairs. Yeah, uh, the Ames building, I'm sure many of you are familiar for, with it, with its distinctive architecture. It was restored in the early 2000s to its original appearance. It suffered extensive damage in the 1906 earthquake, but was repaired. Um, and Dr. Ames was a handwriting expert um, who spent his later years in Mountain View. And um, as, as it was originally designed, ground floor was commercial and upstairs was residential. It was one of the first mixed use buildings in Mountain View. Um, and we have a lot, of, a lot more of those these days, yes. And the post office, we sort of know where it was located. I was able to find this image on the uh, archives of the library. Um, and, but we got, there, was, there was no date attached to the photograph. So we're assuming this would be about the time that, that uh, women would have been sending photograph, I mean, uh, postcards uh, to their friends and neighbors. And this was one photo that we were able to um, locate. And Nick can talk more about this. Yeah, so this is the Rogers building. Um, it Again, it still stands today. It's just been heavily remodeled. The post office was on the ground floor. Um, there was four spaces there as there are today for retail businesses. Um, you can tell it's the same building if you just look at the openings and where the windows are located. It just has a different facade than it did originally. And uh, uh, Mountain View City Hall, um, the cornerstone was laid in November of 1909 and was um, completed sometime in 1910. It's also a public library was located upstairs. Yeah, so this was our, our first uh, town hall. Prior to that, um, the Mountain View Board of Trustees, which was what the city council was called at the time, met in the upper floor of a different swall building on Castro Street, but this was the first building custom built as a city hall. Um, and it was demolished in the 1950s. Um, and then for many years, there was a bank on the site, a one-story bank building. And then there was Tung Ki Noodle House for a while. And then in the early 2000s, the current building on the corner of Castro in California, which is now home to Scratch Restaurant uh, with offices above, replaced it. But there, for the eagle eye, that there is a small plaque uh, on the side of the building that shows the original city hall, the town hall um, that I got the city to put there when I was a high school intern at the Mountain View Planning Department. So next time you're walking along Castro Street, uh, keep an eye out for that little plaque. And then lastly, I was curious um, to find out how much did women really get engaged after they uh, had the chance to um, be full citizens and vote? 
So um, again, very cumbersome to try to find this, but I was finally able to locate uh, Mountain View Precinct number two voter registration for November of 1912. And on the rolls were 295 registered voters. And of those 44% uh, were women. So women got themselves organized and voted, um, or at least registered in any case. So that's the end of that. All right, so the next segment of our program, um, and thank you, Pamela, for putting together again the video and the slideshow. Really appreciate it. I hope folks enjoyed that. And again, if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A and we'll get to them at the end. But before we do that, we are very happy to turn it over to Dr. Amy Ellison, who's going to tell us about the Los Altos History Museum's exhibit about the history of women's suffrage. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Ellison to share her screen and, and walk us through some images and information about that fantastic exhibit. Great, awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, so I have shared my screen. Hopefully that is um, viewable to everybody. Okay, great. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Nick and Pam for inviting me to talk at this meeting today. I'm really excited to be here and share um, what we've done over at the Los Altos History Museum. And I have to give a huge shout out to Pam also, not only for that amazing video, which was just awesome, um, but also for doing so much research and for really helping us um, a lot to put this exhibit together um, with, of course, with the help of the Mountain View Historical Association, um, being able to do research there. Um, you know, Pam found some amazing things. So I'm excited to, um, to share uh, sort of what the exhibit looks like and hopefully you'll be able to um, come and see it yourself soon. So we uh, were very excited to be able to finally reopened to the public. We were closed for quite a while, as you can imagine, because of the pandemic, but we were able to open our doors with this exhibit just a couple of weeks ago on October 15th. And so this is, this is the exhibit. If you come and see it, we're open um, Thursday to Sunday from 12 to four. Um, if you wanna stop by and, um, and take a look and you know, all the safety precautions are in place. And so uh, it's a very safe environment for you to come and, and see this exhibit. So I'll just give you a sort of a little taste here today um, of what we cover in the exhibit and some of the things that you'll be able to come and see. So one of the, um, the exhibit sort of starts um, by exploring the national movement because of course that's what, this, that's what this year is all about. That's why we wanted to do this exhibition. Um, this year was because we're celebrating 100 years this year of women's suffrage. So it really is a celebration of the 19th Amendment and marking that momentous anniversary. So telling the national story, you know, we are a local history museum, but telling that national story and putting the local history into this larger context was really important to us. So we spent, um, you know, a, a, a decent amount of the exhibit um, talking about what went on at the national level and, um, and what that looked like. And so many of um, of the, the campaign tactics, the ways that um, suffragists drew attention to the cause, the, um, the techniques that they used to um, ultimately um, have a successful movement. And we also, um, we also bring it into, into the present as well. We start with that, um, you know, the history of suffrage and we bring it into the present. I'll come back to this slide as well. Um, but this is, uh, this is where I wanted to start here with some, some of the more familiar um, faces with Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, um, women picketing the White House. Uh, we wanted to tell this story um, and to put the local story into, into this larger national context. Um, and also to really explore those um, tactics that a lot of suffragists, both in California and at the national level, um, employed to bring visibility to the cause. So you can see here examples of um, parades, of pageants, um, women here in, in Washington, DC, um, staging a pageant to draw attention. Music, this is written by um, a California suffragist, Elizabeth Lowe Watson, um, to the tune of Glory, Glory, Hallelujah. Um, other, other suffrage um, sheet music and anti-suffrage sheet music as well. It was used by both sides. Um, to really bring it into the home, bring really get a, a you know an earworm in there and, and catchy little um, tunes that sort of stick with you. That was another way of of campaigning. Tea parties. This was especially um, uh, 
useful in Northern California, actually the Equality Tea Company was a Northern California tea company um, and was a, a major fundraiser for the suffrage movement here. So we wanted to you know, really delve into how these women were campaigning. And you heard a little bit, bit about this too with, um, with Pam's video about um, you know, rallies at Swalls Hall at um, the Glen Theater. Um, all of these were different ways that, you know, there were many, many different ways that women um, met and organized and, um, and increased support for the movement. So again, you know, we wanted to tell this national story um, in order to sort of set the stage for uh, and to really highlight the importance of the local history as well, um, which actually looks very different than the national story. The national story, of course, it's all about 1920. Um, that's the centennial that we're celebrating around the country. But if you look at California's history of suffrage, um, Santa Clara County's history of suffrage, it looks very different. Um, California women got the right to vote in 1911. And it's really important to us as, of course, as a local history museum to tell that local story and, um, and to look at how women campaigned here in Santa Clara County. But it's all, it was very important to us to also show the importance of the local suffrage movement to the national movement, actually. Um, because Santa Clara County, and, and you heard from, from uh, Pam's video, that Santa Clara County was one of the few Bay Area counties that voted in favor of women's suffrage. So they were incredibly crucial to um, California uh, women winning the right to vote. And California was actually really crucial in sort of turning the tides for the national movement. Um, when women got the vote here in 1911, it really um, opened, opened the floodgates. Um, and, it, and it was sort of changed the tides and, and it kind of um, galvanized public opinion to sort of lean more towards suffrage and embrace it, um, embrace it more throughout the country. And so California was crucial to, to the success of the 19th Amendment and Santa Clara County was crucial to the success of the suffrage movement in California. So um, we really wanted to, to highlight that and to show that, you know, this, this history is, is important to us as people who live here um, but it also has this larger national significance as well. So that was really important for us to, to show and we're really proud of that um, you know, part of our history. So one of the ways that we wanted to show this was by um, honoring uh, the, the local suffragists that we could find. And um, again, I have to do a huge shout out to Pam here for all her research at the Mountain View Historical Association and Library um, because she was able to uncover, as you see here, Sophia and Ethel Durst um, made it on our, our Hall of Fame wall, um, Alice Park and others that, um, that you heard about in, in Pam's video. Um, we were able to find out a little bit more about these women and um, it was important to, to, um, you know, to, to, to give visitors their names so that we can remember their names um, and we can learn more about them because in a lot of, these names are not necessarily in the history books. Um, Sophia Durst, Ethel Durst, they're not gonna be in your history books. They, Pam had to dig for those names. So it was important to us to put those out there and make sure that they get remembered for what they did for this movement. And I wanna um, highlight a couple of the amazing objects that we have in the exhibit that show, um, uh, again, the importance of, of state movement of, and of the national movement as well. So this um, votes for women's sash that is from the suffrage era and was probably used by a California suffrage. We're not exactly sure um, where it came from, but we know that it is of the time period. And this um, is another one of my favorite objects. So I just wanted to show you a couple of my favorite suffrage era objects. This is a copy of the US Constitution and it was owned by Alice Paul. It was one of the leading suffragists you might've seen the movie about her uh, with Hilary Swank, I think. Um, one of the major uh, suffragists on the national level. This uh, copy of the constitution was owned by her. It was given to her by um, one of her friends later in life. Um, it was towards the end of her life um, when she was campaigning for the ERA. And um, uh, her friends um, uh, got it back. And this was her, this is actually her friend's handwriting but the underline was by Alice Paul. And they were working together as members of the, the lead, the AAW, working to um, pass the Equal Rights Amendment. So this, um, again, it sort of ties it all together, the importance of 
um, California, of working here in California um, towards, um, towards uh, federal amendments and federal um, national women's rights. So um, I've talked a lot about um, you know, the importance of doing this exhibit this year because it celebrates 100 years of women getting the right to vote. But we, we wanted to acknowledge, it was very important to me and to the museum that we acknowledge that not all women, not all men had the right to vote in, with the 19th Amendment with, um, with that passage in 1920. Um, African Americans um, in particular had to wait much longer for that. So we wanted to, at the same time, you know, we, as we're celebrating this, this major um, marker of 100 years of women getting the right to vote, we also wanted to sort of challenge that, that narrative because in a lot of areas of the country, it has not been 100 years um, where people, where women and, and men um, of color have had the right to vote. So it was very important for us to um, to look at that narrative and to, to show that that, um, you know, 100 years is looking at it in terms of just the history of the 19th Amendment and not necessarily at the history of voting rights, which has a very different, um, different narrative and different periodization. So um, that's where it was very important for us to challenge that. So we, we wanted to um, to really acknowledge the African-American suffragists um, who worked at the national and at the local level um, to acknowledge that um, the struggle for voting rights did not end in 1920, um, to look at the, the Voting Rights Act, um, the Civil Rights Act, and the fight, you know, um, in the 1960s, and even going into the 70s, and even um, still today in many areas of the country, um, you know, where, where communities of color are facing voter suppression. So to look at, to frame the 19th Amendment in terms of the history of voting rights, rather than just the history of the amendment itself, was very important to us. And these are a few of the African-American suffragists that we were able to learn more about. Um, Sarah Massey Overton, Hetty Tillman, and Naomi Anderson were all in the Bay Area and did really remarkable things um, working for, um, for, for women, for suffrage, um, for African-American women in particular, for children. Um, they were very involved in their communities. And um, Sarah Massey Overton actually in San Jose um, helped to found an interracial suffrage league, which really was extraordinary. Um, oftentimes they were segregated. Many of the white suffragists did not want um, to include African-American suffragists or um, allow them into their organizations. And oftentimes they were separate suffrage organizations. But in San Jose, there was at least one interracial uh, suffrage organization. So Sarah Massey Overton was really crucial in forming that. So it was very important to us to also um, you know, include their names in this exhibit so that people could learn more about these remarkable women in, who lived in our, in our area, in our region. And again, just bringing it into the present. So this actually is um, one of my favorite uh, banners that we have, some of my, my favorite images that we have in the exhibit. This in particular on the right. This photo here, I believe you saw in Pam's, um, in Pam's slides. This was, um, a march in Oakland. It was either 1908, which would have been the first suffrage march in the United States, which was held in Oakland. So this was either in 1908 or in 1915 during the World's Fair, when uh, suffragists also helped to campaign for the national movement. So this is a march in Oakland in uh, 1908 or 1915. This is Inez Milholland. She was famous as the sort of face of the suffrage movement and famous for riding a horse um, down the streets of Washington, New York, LA, um, big cities around the country she would tour and she would lead the parade on horseback. And she just looked so regal um, and she became the face of the movement. And here we are in 2020 with Brianna Noble and many of you have probably seen this image because it's, it happened this summer um, with the protests against police brutality after the murder of George Floyd. Um, Brianna Noble riding her horse through the streets of Oakland, um, protesting inequality. So there are parallels, um, whatever your, your politics are, whatever you think about that, um, there are parallels at least in the, the, the tactics 
and in what they are, are fighting for, what are they protesting against? What are they marching for? So we wanted to, to show, and of course here you see the suffragists and um, women marching in 1964 uh, for voting rights. So it doesn't end in 1920. And that was the big message that we wanted to get across. So I hope that that comes through in the exhibit. I hope you get a chance to come and see um, how, we, how, how we have um, tried to bring it into the present and show those um, the continued relevance of the suffragists today and their legacy um, that prevails really through into um, the current day. Um, and other acts, acts of exclusion as well. So of course the Chinese um, Exclusion Act, um, Chinese immigrants were not allowed to vote and Native, Native Americans, which are also not recognized as citizens. Um, also the 19th Amendment did not um, help these groups as well. So we wanted to, um, you know, uh, really dedicate a part of this exhibit to the women who were left out, the women and men and groups of people who were left out of this amendment. And it's not all, um, you know, it's, it's a celebratory moment, but it's, it, we also have to look at, um, you know, uh, the failures of the movement as well. And it was important to us to, again, bring it into the present day and, um, and look at the legacy of um, what happened after, after women got the vote, both here and at the national level. Um, how, how did women run for office, um, especially here in Santa Clara County? So actually, this was news to me. Um, Newsweek in, I believe it was 1980, called Santa, uh, Santa Clara County the feminist capital of the world. And that was because so many women were running for office and it really started with this woman here, um, Janet Gray Hayes, who became um, the first female mayor of a major city in the United States, which was San Jose. And her um, becoming mayor really opened the floodgates as well. Um, she and, um, and other women encouraged other women to run and to vote. And you just see this huge um, outpouring of women who become, um, who start running for office, who are elected into office. This is the um, Los Altos Women's Caucus here, which I wanted to include because um, women who support other women in running for office was a huge reason why so many women actually won in the 70s, 80s, and still today. In, our, in Los Altos, our own history, we wanted to look at our own history of women who became mayor Audrey Fisher was the first mayor of Los Altos um, in the 1960s. Jane Reed, um, Penny Lave um, were, were hugely influential mayors in town and um, influential residents here. So we wanted to um, you know, show some of the more recent history of women who, um, who held office in Los Altos and made a difference uh, that way. And were able to do so because of um, their foremothers um, who, fought, who fought for them. And of course, our, uh, in Los Altos, we are currently, I believe, currently the only um, city in California to have an all-female city council, so all five women. And um, I believe it's only the third time that that has happened in California, um, California history. So it really is a rare thing. So we wanted to celebrate our current city council women as well. Um, and I just wanted to, to mention, uh, I, I certainly hope that you'll all be able to come and see our, um, our indoor exhibit. Um, it is, uh, I think it's really cool. I, I know that I'm, I'm biased in that regard, but I hope that you'll be able to come and see it. We have some really amazing um, objects and videos and, um, and, and images. And um, I hope that you'll be able to come and see that history. But we also recognize that um, you know a lot of people are not willing to go indoors at this moment. That um, you know for whatever reason um, you know you might not feel safe coming inside. And so we are also offering an outdoor exhibit as well. So it's it's also at the museum. It's at our um, at the J. Gilbert Smith House, and uh, you won't be able to see you know the objects and things. It is it is a much smaller show, but um, we hope that that gives something to. Um, to people who don't feel comfortable going indoors yet. So you're more than welcome to come and see um, either the indoor exhibit, which is Thursday to Sunday, or the outdoor exhibit, which is up 24 seven. So stop by any time to learn about suffrage uh, in Los Altos. And please vote, <laughs> wear a mask and please vote. Um, here are just a few, uh, few of our upcoming programs. So we hope that you'll tune in. They're all on Zoom um, because again, we're, we're you know, 
everything's very uncertain right now. So we hope that you'll be able to tune into that um, as well. So um, I'm happy to answer, answer any questions and um, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Dr. Ellison. That was fantastic. Really appreciate the time and uh, the exhibit looks fantastic. And like you said, I hope folks get a chance to go and visit either the outdoor or the indoor exhibit. Um, but that was great. And thank you for putting that in the larger national context. We do have a bunch of questions that have come in. Um, they're questions I don't know the answer to, so I'm guessing they're gonna be for either you, Dr. Ellison, or for Pamela. Um, so I, I'll go ahead and start asking them. Um, so Sharon asked, do we know of any deaf suffragettes? Um, that's a great question. Um, you know, off the top of my head, the only one that I know is Helen Keller. Um, Helen Keller actually, you know, was, um, a, you know, a humanitarian. She was, she advocated for a number of causes, and that includes women's suffrage. Um, and she was, she also helped to found the ACLU. Um, so H Helen Keller is the only one I know off the top of my head, but that's a really, really good question. Thank you for asking that. Great. Well, next question is, uh, Ida Rose asks, are there any studies or information on how women being able to vote changed the nature of campaigning? Um, noting there was a huge shift in a short period. Yes. Going to the library. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Glad this is handy. So this is a new book. Is it backwards on your screen or just on mine? Just on yours. It looks just good on mine. Okay. So it's called Why They Marched, Untold Stories of the Women Who Fought for the Right to Vote. And it's not all about that question specifically about um, campaigning, but it does have a number of chapters. Um, it focuses on different suffragists um, around the country. And so you get a really good um, variety of how they campaigned in different ways and in different places. So I think this is, um, it's very, it's highly readable. It's brand new. It came out this year for the, the centennial. Um, so that's why I, I recommend it. But um, I'm not sure of any books that are dedicated specifically to um, to campaigning. Although uh, there, if, if there isn't, there certainly is a book to be written there because um, you saw, I, I, I'm not, I think this was in Pam's slides, but I know it's also in my slide, the, um, the women picketing in front of the White House. That was the first picket of the White House. Um, the suffragists did that. And um, and you can see, and I sort of skipped skipped over one of the slides where we talked about the Women's March. Uh, we showed signs from the Women's March in 2017 um, in San Jose. And we showed that because you can see there is a direct um, comparison between the Women's March in 2017 and, and subsequent Women's Marches and the, the, the suffragist marches through Washington DC in, in uh, 1913 through New York, um, in Oakland, um, all over the country women were marching. And so there are direct parallels there, whatever, whatever your politics are, um, there are parallels there. Um, they are drawing on that legacy. So definitely um, they did have a huge influence on the way that people were, um, or the history of, of campaigning. It's a really, really interesting question. I'll chime in here a little bit too. Um, so I found one article, actually it's right after the passage in uh, 1911 and the editor, Mr. Smith of the Register Leader wrote an article in which he complimented the women um, locally in that they waged a very fair campaign. They didn't vilify anybody else, um, that they kept a very positive um, moving forward type of a campaign rather than calling men all idiots or you know whatever. Um, so I think perhaps there might have been again that the whole underlying theme of women was uh, civility. Um, we're going to tame this crazy politics. Um, we're going to make politics a more noble endeavor. Um, so I think there was probably a little of influence on that now how long that lasted or whatever, but I think the American women in American suffrage uh, movement were really trying to conduct a persistent and pervasive um, effort, but not resort to um, name calling or being nasty about it. Right, or violence too. And that was a huge, nonviolence was a huge tenant of the suffragists in the United States, right. um, not in Britain 
um, there were there were a little bit more radical um, across the board. Yeah, in, fact, in the United States, um, because things got pretty crazy in England. In England, the women were called suffragettes, E T T E. In the United States, the women decided we're not going to be calling ourselves suffragettes because then everybody thinks we're going to be doing the same things that they were doing in Great Britain. So they called themselves suffragists, mm -hmm. I S T. So there was a transition in the naming of what women called themselves because they didn't want to be associated with uh, more violent tendencies. All right. Um, next question is from Eric. Was there any significant intersection between movements for racial equity and women's suffrage in Mountain View? Um, and kind of asking, not sure if there's significant minority population in Mountain View at that time. Um. Yes and no. I mean, a lot of the suffrage um, was considered to be for white women. Um, I, I don't know whether I should say it or not, but I will. So there was a, um, a couple of articles covering some of the suffrage meetings. And as I said, they were doing entertainment. And there was a woman who did darky renditions. And everybody laughed at them. And I, when I read that, I thought, oh, my God. So, um, I mean, we have to view it in the context of the times, et cetera, et cetera. But there was definitely underlying racism. Um, again, a lot of it was considered, this is for white women, not for women of color. Um, as Amy said, um, the black or African-American, whatever terminology you want to use, women's suffrage had their own organizations because a lot of the white women did not um, embrace them in their their efforts. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with you, Pam. Um, we it, we don't really know. Um, I, we don't know as much as we want to about um, you know our local movements. That's for sure. But um, I haven't seen much that would um, make me very confident that the women who were advocating for suffrage were also advocating for um, racial equality as well. Uh, I, I suspect not for the most part. Um, but as I mentioned um, in, in my PowerPoint, um, there, there were African-American suffragists in Santa Clara County. So we know at, at least of one, Sarah Massey Overton, who um, was in San Jose and um, was involved in a number of different organizations and, that helped, um, that advocated for women's suffrage, but also for um, African-American um, uplift as well. And so, you know, we know of her name. So for every every woman that we know, that we know of, that we read about, there were many others that their names are not in the paper, their names are not in the history books. So, you know, we, we have to assume she was not the only one, um, only one there, but she is the only one that, that I have read about that we were able to find um, more out about in the newspapers. One thing I do want to also add to that was this was part of the progressive movement. And as I said in my presentation, the women's clubs were really taking on um, food safety. Um, I saw an art, a program on, on uh, KQED. Um, there was a gentleman in the 19, early 1910s who was trying to, he was part of the federal government trying to get um, better food laws. Food was really adulterated. Flour would be added, a chop would be added to flour. Um, formaldehyde would be added to milk because it would cover the, the sour taste. Um, it, there, it was really unsafe. In fact, Teddy Roosevelt during um, the 19, 1898 Cuba campaign complained about how bad the meat was, the canned meat that the men had to eat. So this doctor enlisted women's clubs and women's suffrage movements to put pressure on the federal government to get these food safety laws enacted. And he really attributes the fact that there were these active women in women's clubs and suffrage movements to helping get food safety, child labor laws. So there was a, there was a, there were other things that were achieved, but there, yet there were still things that were left unaddressed. And just kind of a, a note on the kind of second part in parentheses to your question, Eric, about Mountain View's population at the time. Um, there was a significant Chinese population in Mountain View back then. You have to remember that even in the 1880s, the Chinese Exclusion Act was happening, but there was a population, there was a Chinatown on um, Villa Street, right outside of downtown. Um, I believe the Japanese American community had started to immigrate into Mountain View by that time. And then there was much larger waves of immigration that happened 
in the 1920s, but it was a racially diverse community back then. And so a lot of the people, as was noted in Dr. Ellison's presentation, you know, this wasn't a complete, you know, victory. This, this took generations to achieve uh, voting rights for all. Okay, um, thank you both for your answers to that question. There's a kind of similar question, uh, or not similar, but related. Were Blacks prohibited from voting in California, any part of California? Um, um, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, so I don't want to, I don't want to um, say, but there were, so a, a lot of times what would happen is, and this would happen, especially in the South, um, there, by law, um, you know, anybody would be able to vote, right, that had the right to vote. Um, but there would be either state laws or municipal laws, city laws, county laws um, that would require a poll tax or that would require literacy tests. Um, or there would be physical threats of physical violence as well. So even if um, African-Americans had the right to vote in, in a specific city, there might be people who were standing outside the hall with guns um, just waiting for um, African-Americans to show up. And so that would deter a lot of people. So there were it's kind of hard to to say how much that um, that stuff that might have been off the books happened, um, but I, I so I think that was mainly um, you know in in the South, but I I don't know about every place in in California, so I hesitate to to give a definitive answer on that. Thank you. Um, so the final question um, is where is the exhibit located? Can you describe <laughs> the location of the Los Altos History Museum? Yeah. Those? So we are at 51 South San Antonio. So just head down uh, from Mountain View down San Antonio. We're right by the library, by the Civic Center there, um, right across um, San Antonio from the downtown. And we are open Thursday to Sunday from 12 to four. And like I said, the outdoor exhibit is, um, is up 24 seven. And I, I should also mention, since I'm doing the plug, um, Thursdays are, um, we reserve for high risk visitors. So if, um, uh, on a normal day, Friday to Sunday, we allow six people in the gallery at one time. So it is very spaced out. People are socially distanced. But if you wanted to reserve the museum um, for yourself, for your own um, visitor group, you could do that on Thursdays. You just go to our website and um, reserve a time on a Thursday. And no, no other visitors would be in there at the same time that you are in there. So we're really trying to, um, you know, make people feel comfortable, as comfortable as you can in this crazy time. So um, come, you know, if you're, um, if you're high risk, if you're worried about it, please, you know, come on, on Thursdays and um, if you're less worried, Fridays to Sundays, but um, we are really doing a lot to ensure safety of, of visitors and, and our volunteers and staff. Thank you. One question that wasn't asked, but I will answer anyway. Uh, so the first woman elected to the Mountain View City Council was Judith, Mo Judith Moss, and that wasn't until 1973. And she was also the first mayor that was female uh, in 1975. So, you know, not too long ago, you know, all politics is local, make sure you go out there and vote. I know we have a presidential election that everyone is paying attention to, but there's so many other important things to pay attention to on the local ballot. So make sure that you go out there if you haven't already, Go and vote. Thank you for those who already voted on our little democracy here in the Mountain View Historical Association. And thank you again so much. Uh, any final remarks from either of you before we close it out? Oh, just thank you again for having me and um, yeah, go vote and come see the exhibit. <laughs> and again, thanks to, uh, to the Mountain View Historical Association for letting me uh, um, feed my obsession here of uh, <laughs> doing some research and having some some place that I can actually uh, do something with all the pages and pages of things that I found. So I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you both again. I hope everyone uh, enjoyed that as much as I did. Um, please uh, take a look at our website for our next event, which will be in the winter, um, February, I believe, but mountainviewhistorical.org. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. Um, follow us, share the news. We will share this link to those who were attending and gave us their email address so you can share it with your friends. Um, and again, thank you both. And I hope everyone has a, a wonderful afternoon and wish everyone the best. And uh, as your president, I'm signing off for the final time and I'm very excited to hand it over to Pamela. So uh, mm -hmm. thank you all again.
Thank you. Bye. Bye.